continue to celebrate our Lord together as we sing the hymn of praise number 117. O oh God, our help in ages past, we'll sing all the verses. to remind us of the amazing grace that you have 
have stumbled upon us. We love you so very much. We ask this this morning, O oh God, in our name. We ask in the name of the one who us to pray as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. snakes bite people. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pull that into the sermon a little bit and kind of, kind of see what's going on with that. Uh, we are glad, well, I guess, you know, too, I guess it's better to talk about snakes biting people than us passing out snakes to hunt and hunt them. I guess that's an act too. Not happening with that. We're glad you're here with us this morning after you come together to worship. I hope that you came into the sanctuary 
compare the newsletter, the newsletter is always the best way to kind of keep up with the great things happening here in the life of our church. There are a few things I want to highlight to you as you, as you came in today. Um, First, as you open up your newsletter, uh, you see there's a, man, there's a lot of great opportunities right now in the life of our church for Bible study. You know, we always have our weekly Sunday morning Bible studies that go on, our Sunday schools that go on here on Sunday mornings. But we have our Wednesday night live programming. We would invite you to take your cue pads and fill that out. And let us know if you're going to be here Wednesday night so that our kitchen staff can properly prepare for that. Uh, also, give us any contact info you'd like to share with us. So we have our Wednesday Night Live programming that goes on. Then we have various other Bible studies. We have a women's Bible studies, a men's Bible study. I'm teaching a Bible study. There are a lot of great ways, a lot of different times, that hopefully one of these can fit into your schedule. So if you're not plugged into a, a, a Bible study of some sort or a group of some sort, I really want to Brian reminded us, talking about these things that define our life, that you can find your place in a group here at St. Matthew's to better, to better study God's Word. So I would encourage you to be part of that if you've not done that. I uh, also want to encourage you, if you've got children, uh, to get involved in our children's ministry. Last night, I was scrolling through Facebook, and we had a daddy-daughter dance last night, and a lot of the, a lot of the, the little girls looked beautiful. One or two of the dads did look beautiful, I guess, not, not being the so, uh, but it was fun to see all these uh, young young people together in the church having a good time as daddies and daughters. So lots of great activities going on in the life of our children and also in the life of our youth. Uh, you may notice the bulletin. Uh, there's a need that Nick let them have for some, 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 some gym dads to come. I know every father here is an athletic marvel. Um, just, and you are living to show your youth and your children that you can still hop. You still look mean, Frank. I mean, seriously. I mean, I, I, when I said that that Frank Smith, the first name popped in my mind. So, I mean, I know that many of you are just looking for that, that way to vicariously live out your athletic ability for our youth to see. Nicolette needs some, some guys to come and hang out with our youth on some nights and just be a, a great influence and, uh, and, and play with our youth and, and help them um, in this time. So if that's something you'd like to do, talk to Nicolette or any of our youth folk, they can tell you how to serve. So as you can see, lots of great ways to plug in and serve here in our church, and I hope you'll find, uh, find your place. At this time, let's continue worshiping as we take our morning tithes and offerings.
trustworthy. Every day you graciously provide what we need from your abundance. We are grateful that you bring healing and hope for our lives as individuals and as a faith community. Please accept these monetary gifts and offerings to strengthen our church's outreach to our neighbors. May more people come to know you and your love through our ministries. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. It's now time for the children's moment, so if the children would come join us up front.
from not from Genesis. From Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. I invite you to follow along in your own personal Bible if you have your Bible with you this morning, or if not, you can look along in our Pew Bible in front of you, or back over in worship, or you can listen for God's word this morning. Reading from Genesis chapter 8, verses 20 through 22. Then Noah built the ark for the Lord, and took every clean animal, and every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the pleasing odor, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of humankind. For the inclination of the human heart is evil for me. Nor will I ever again destroy every, every living creature as I have done. As long as the earth endures, springtime and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. This is the word of God, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You know, it's interesting how many stories or concepts in Scripture we picture one way. We kind of, in our mind, have this image of what they look like, what they should be like. And then when, when, when you dig down into the culture and the context of Scripture, you find that they might be a little bit different than what our, our cultural context tells us. Well, what do I mean by What do I mean by that? A great example of that is when we look upon Joseph, what he did for a living. He was a carpenter. Okay, Joseph was a carpenter. So... I, I think I'm not going to project upon you, but in my mind, when I think of a carpenter, I think of a guy with the, the big pencil behind his ear, measuring once, measuring twice, cutting once. I mean, that's, that's what I'm thinking of the guy, you know, framing their house, or, or the guy, the gal that's really good at woodwork, that has a shop that builds the, the beautiful pieces of wood. Like, that, that's, that's what I associate with a carpenter. I think of wood. That's just kind of where my mind naturally goes, is to somebody that's gifted and skilled and works with wood. Okay, that's most of our American context. Well, when you go to Homeland, you don't see a lot of wood. You see some olive trees, you see some cedar trees, but you don't see a lot of wood. So to call Joseph a carpenter, it's not incorrect. But really, what Joseph worked with wasn't wood so much as it was stone. Joseph may have could have been better understood in terms of the stone mason, not so much what we think of as a carpenter. The color of a carpenter is not incorrect. It's just he's working with stone, not with wood. Okay, that's one thing. We, uh, you know, we think of we think of so many things through our eyes. I think of Jesus. Going into the wilderness. You know, so when I think of Jesus going into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days, I kind of have my South Mississippi eyes on it. So I'm picturing Jesus going off into the woods. Or maybe perhaps, you know, going off like to the to to the to the wilderness of the American frontier. I made a joke this morning about the Oregon Trail video game that everyone died of dysentery. I'm see who laughs at that joke. Some of you that are my age remember playing the Oregon Trail and, and that game. So we think of we, we think of Jesus, you know, we think we, in our minds, we think of Jesus going off and to make this wooded area or this frontier land. In the context of the old te of the Holy Land, Jesus is going off into the desert. Going off into the deepest, darkest desert you can think of. Very dreary. Maybe foreboding, very alone. But it wasn't a wooded area. But it was a deep, dark desert. Okay. We think of angels. And we think of angels as cute little naked babies with bone arrows. And all the Valentine's Day cards, all the cartoons. Like, oh, all cute little cute, cute little angels, aren't they sweet? You want to pet them like a bunny rabbit. Just aren't they sweet? Go read your Bible. Every time an angel appears to anyone in scripture, what is the first word the angel says to the individual? Do not be afraid. Do not fear. Angels are not cute little naked babies. 
They are awful. They are amazing. They are other. And every time in Scripture someone encounters an angel, they go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You are different than me. You are other. You are something beyond my mind's ability to understand, my mind's ability to rationale. I don't know what you are, and I am terrified. I am afraid. Every time someone encounters an angel in Scripture, their first instinct is fear. That's why every time the angel says, do not be afraid. Over and over and over. Okay. Today's story, Noah's Ark, is another example of that, I believe. My, when we were in Ripley, I was first pastor of First Methodist Church in Ripley. We had a, a weekday ministry like we did here at St. Matthew's. They called their weekday ministry Noah's Ark. And so we think of Noah's Ark as oh, all cute little, sweet little cuddly little bunnies and, and deer and it's just sweet. Two by two they get on the ark. Oh, ain't that precious. That is so precious. Oh. Okay, let's come back to reality here. Okay, I got two dogs. I'll make a deal with any of you for one of them following the service if you'd like because every morning about 6.30 we become the crazy cat people. All the cats like to get out of our house. So all, all you hear is 7.30 in the morning, and the dogs are clawing on the windows, and the cats out there just messing with them. Just put these paws up the windows sometimes. Just messing with them. Okay, multiply that by thousands. That's the ark. You got the New Orleans Zoo on a boat. Okay? That sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? A zoo on a boat. If I had insanity in the building of said ark, I would have lost it by the end of those 40 days. Okay, Noah's ark isn't what we think of with these cute little bodies bouncing up and down and everybody being happy. It's a, it's a zoo on a boat. That's not what our minds think. So what's actually happening here in Noah's ark? What's this whole story about? Why does all this thing happen? What is the point God's trying to tell us when we get to Noah's Ark? Okay, to understand Noah's Ark, you got to hit rewind. You got to hit rewind and go back to Genesis chapter 3. If you've been following along with our Rooted in Christ Bible study plan, we talked about Noah's Ark and some of this a few, a few months, about a few weeks ago. If you've not joined our our daily Bible study program we're doing here in St. Matthews, there's some information in the bulletin. I would encourage you to, to text in to our number and, and, and text that message in there and get our scriptures sent to your cell phone every morning. We also send out an email on Sunday nights. We also have it on our mobile app. We're reading the Bible here together in St. Matthews. If you haven't taken part in that yet, I'll, it's not too late. You have time to join in and, and read the Bible with us. But when we read, to understand Noah's Ark, you need to go back to, uh, to Genesis 3. God creates the garden, makes everything in it, puts Adam and Eve there. He makes Adam and Eve, male and female, he makes them in his image. And he puts them in the garden, puts them to work, and tells them, okay guys, you've got all of this. Everything here in the garden is yours, everything. But whatever you do, don't touch that. So what do they do? As soon as God turns away, they go and touch it. Because that's what we do. So they go and touch it. They sin. They willingly and knowingly violated the clear command and instruction of God. They sinned. And we are their children, prone to wander, Lord, I fear it, prone to leave the God I love. We, too, get distracted by the bright, shiny things in the corner of our eye, don't we? But it isn't just those things that God instructs us to do that we, that we don't do. That, we, that, that we, we do these things God tells us not to do. But we are, as the Lord says in Genesis 8, 
The intent of the human heart is evil. So it isn't just it isn't just that I do things that are wrong, but I have in me this. Sometimes I find myself doing things and I said, why did I do that? What was I thinking? I don't really know, but I did it. We have in us this desire sometimes to do things that we know we shouldn't do. The effect of the fall. So the fall happened. Adam and Eve do the thing they were commanded not to do. Hit fast forward. We get to Cain and Abel. Cain, Cain kills Abel. Spoiler alert. Cain kills Abel. First murder. And then it spins and it spins and it spins and it spins. Until we get Lamech a few, a few, a Lamech a few generations later. They says, y'all think Cain was bad? Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. I, I'm going to kill somebody just because I can. They look at me funny. As the great theologian John Cash once said, I killed a man in Reno just to watch him die. Yeah, that's what we do. We do these things that are wrong. We don't even know why we do them. That's what sin does. It spins, it spins, it spins. It grows, it grows, it grows. And we look up and we've got this thing that we don't know what to do with. And we don't even know how it happens. And we're utterly confused by it all. And so we get to Noah. And the word says that God said he was sorry. He created humanity. That's how far sin had spun out of control to where the God of creation grieved that he does this. Our sin affected him. It affected the relationships of that day, affected all of creation, affected everything. That's what sin does. That's what sin does. Adam and Eve, Scripture says, Walked with God in the cool of the evening. And now it had gotten to the point that God regretted that he had even made them. So then what does God do? What does God do? When we see the consequences of the sin, we're all about destruction. But then God says this. Okay. I'm going to make a promise to you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. I will never again destroy the earth in this way. And I will put a rainbow in the sky as a seal of my covenant with you. God chooses to enter into a relationship with humanity. He chooses to say, I will walk with you. I will be your God and you will be my people. I will be in relationship with you, not because you are perfect, but because I am perfect. Not because you are always good, but because I am always good. God is a God of relationship. And God is a God of restoration. And God is a God that redeems that which sin has taken. So we always ask during Lent, well, where is Jesus in these Old Testament stories? Where is Jesus in these things? Jesus is there in the relational aspect of God. That God tells Adam and Eve, and there's what God tells Noah, yes, there has been great consequence for the sin of humanity, but I will redeem and I will restore and I will be your God and I will be in relationship with you. We talked about the snake earlier. When they bit, when the snake bit them, the Lord told Moses, hold up, a, hold up a bronze snake on a pole, and everyone who looks to the snake will live. Okay, who got the whole thing started in Genesis 3? With the fruit? The serpent. Do you see that God even redeemed that? That God even redeemed this serpent, this serpent that brought death. Now, with the redemptive power of life, when you look to the serpent, you will live. 
Look at every hospital in the country. What is their symbol? That snake. That is the redemptive power of God. There's nothing he can't redeem. There's nothing he can't restore. But how does he do it? He does it through covenants like he made with Noah. He does it through relationships like he does with you and me. How are we restored to God? How are we made new? How are we forgiven? Through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Not through our own works, lest no man can boast. But we are saved, we are redeemed, we are restored by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's how God redeems the world. That's how God saves the world. Through relationships. That's what he told Noah. Never again will I do this act. I will enter into a relationship with you. And the rainbow will be a sign of his covenant. So then, how does God choose to save the world today? How does God choose to redeem the world today? How does God choose to restore the world today? Through relationships. Yes, a relationship with Jesus. But don't you see your part? Through your relationships with others. Through your presence with others. Through you is how God chooses to save the world through his son. Through your relationships. Through what you do. Through your presence. You can change the world. Of all the ways that God could have chosen to have redeemed and saved and restored the world, he chose the church. He chose you. You get to impact the world through your relationships, through your friendships, through these things. You can change someone. It doesn't have to be big and grand and glorious. It just needs to be authentic in a relationship. One of my favorite dynamics in all the world, one of my favorite relationships is that relationship in AA between a person and their sponsor. When someone walking the 12 steps finds that moment when the temptation comes, when the old life calls back, when the rut of the past appears again. And it's so easy to fall back to the old ways. It's so easy to get back in the rut. Y'all know how easy it is. Ruts are called ruts for a reason. It's so easy to fall back into it, isn't it? You don't believe me? Miss a Sunday at church. The second one you miss is easier than the first one. Third one's easier than the second one. By the fourth one, you aren't even thinking. The six months out, you realize you haven't been to church in six months. That's the way it works. When these individuals walk into 12 steps, feel the pressures of life and the struggles, they can call their sponsor day or night, and they know that person will be there, interceding for them, pulling for them, present with them, in relationship with them, in those relationships saving lives. Those relationships change lives. Those relationships restore things that sin has taken. That, to me, is beautiful. God, in the response to the flood, chose to save the world through relationships. God saves you through a relationship with Jesus Christ. God wants to change the world through our relationship with others as we proclaim Christ. So many people tell me they don't want to teach in church. I'm a preacher. I don't have that gift. I can't teach. I don't have that gift. I'm not a teacher. Okay. I respect that. 
Are you asking for men to come give an hour or so of their time in the gym on Sunday nights and hang out with our youth? We're not asking you to teach. We're asking you to simply be present, be an example, build a relationship with these youth. Form that relationship. I'm not asking you to teach Leviticus to them. I'm asking you just to be present. Just to be a relationship with them. Just to form those bonds. Because that's what our hearts are crying out for. Our hearts are crying out to know that we matter. Our hearts are crying out to know that someone cares about us. Our hearts are crying out to know that someone values us. And the only way folks know he cares is through relationships. That's how God saves us, is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's how God wants to redeem the world through Christ, through our relationships with each other. That's what Noah shows us who God is. Will you allow God to use you in some way to show his grace to someone? He has saved us through relationships. May we show his grace to a dying world through our relationships. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the power of redemption and the power of relationships. Father God, help us to live, to love, to be present all of, all of life, and to live out your power of relationships. We love you. We ask in Jesus' sweet and holy name. Amen. As is our custom, on the first Sunday of the month, we invite you now for our service of Holy Communion. I invite you to turn with me to page 12 in your hymnal for our service of communion. to his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and who seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not hurt our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us from willful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us when we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us into your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights, you bore, uh, bore up the ark and the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made covenant with every living creature on the earth. When you led your people to Mount Sinai for forty days and forty nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your, pro your prophet Elijah fasted for forty days and forty nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, when you gave him to save us from our sin. 
Your spirit led him to the wilderness, where he fasted for forty days and forty nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died upon the cross for our sin, you raised him to life. Presented him alive to the apostles during forty days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism and suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us into repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these forty days of Lent we may be gifted in grace to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. And then I would have gave himself for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in your remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Poured out you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here in the gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ that be by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ. One with each other, and one to minister to all the world till Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord of our table, this table does not belong to me, or St. Matthews, the United Methodist Church, or to any religious group. This table is Christ's table. And all who wish to come to this table are welcome. Another word of housekeeping, we, uh, we have in the past have had all four stations being gluten-free. We've had some issues with our gluten delivery system of the bread. So we're only going to have one gluten-free station. It will be this center aisle right here. Uh, we will provide a gluten-free option for anyone that would like to receive. So we invite you, if you are needing a gluten-free option, to come receive the elements at this middle section right here. We're going to invite those forward who will be assisting to receive communion, and we invite you to come as you are able.
morning, this morning during our final song, the altar remains open. Perhaps we could have made you see if you could have been in faith in Jesus Christ. Today is a great day to see Christ as your Lord and Savior. Perhaps you'd like to learn more about how you can become part of St. Matthew. We would love to talk about how you can become a member of our church. Perhaps you'd like to pray. The altar remains open. This morning, during our final song, the altar is open.